Hey, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Scott Luton and Corinne Bursa with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Corinne, how are we doing? Doing great, thanks. It is a gorgeous day in Metro Atlanta, isn't it? It is a gorgeous day. It is. There's a little crisp in the air. Well, hopefully, we're uh, past the, the fake fall, but we'll see what, what's to come. But uh, this has been gorgeous early October weather for sure. And great to have you here sitting in for Mr. Greg White, who uh, I think is traveling the world somewhere. Who knows? I don't know. Those are big shoes to fill, but I'll do my best. <laughs> well, always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, enjoy your perspective and expertise. And and of course, we've got a great guest today, backed by popular demand, going on a couple of years now. It's Supply Chain Today and Tomorrow with the one and only Mike Griswold with Gartner. So Corinne, as you know, we've got a unique topic today as we're going to be diving into the industry analyst world from a professional or job standpoint. You know, Corinne, this, we're going to be sharing some things that I bet a lot of folks don't know about, right? Yeah, this is kind of an insider's view because industry analysts play a really important role that is between solution and service providers and practitioners or end user companies. And, uh, and certainly Gartner is the most influential of those industry analyst firms. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Mike Griswold has to uh, share with us today. I'm with you. Um, it's, you know, in many ways, it is like uh, getting Max Scherzer to tell us how, how to pitch. You know, <laughs> I knew baseball or... <laughs> was coming in at some point here. So uh, congratulations to uh, those Atlanta Braves. <laughs> hey, I tell you, to, to make it official and, and to win the division for the fifth time in a row this year with the clincher last night, uh, we're, we're definitely, we're, we're dancing in the streets for about a week because uh, of the, the hard work. Uh, begins then with the playoffs, but hey, appreciate it. we're all celebrating. Um, speaking of celebrating, uh, we're going to be saying hello to our wonderful global listenership uh, in just a second. All the folks in cheap seats, y'all get ready. We got a great conversation teed up. Uh, but before we get there, and then of course before we bring in Mike Griswold, I want to touch on just a couple of quick events that we want to make sure stays on people's radar. Uh, we want to begin with uh, the upcoming Gartner IT Symposium and Expo. It's coming up. Um, in mid-October, I'm going to be down there with our friend Mark Holmes. Corinne, one of the smartest folks I know, at least. Uh, you and Mark uh, and Greg, I'll put you in a trio there. Maybe we'll throw in Mike as well. But hey, Mark Holmes with Inner Systems, looking forward to another roundtable focused on delivering fulfillment excellence using a modern data connective tissue technology. So folks, hey. join us for that. Uh, Corinne, is that, uh, that sounds like a good session, doesn't it? It does. I mean, data is the new oil, right, for supply chain. I've got to be able to really harness that and transform it into insight. So important role there. I'm sure you're going to have a, a room full of, uh, of folks that um, are very interested in the topic. I'm with you. Hey, I'm just taking some popcorn and Diet Coke to watch uh, Mark do his magic. So, But uh, hey, folks, if you're down there, join us and definitely uh, let's say hello and catch up. Uh, secondly, one, one, we want to definitely keep this um, humanitarian initiative front and center, you know, depending on what's the news of the day, the headlines change, but the need is still tremendous in Ukraine and Poland and elsewhere. So we're very proud to be supporting this event that our friends at Vector Global Logistics essentially created. And then they've really invited a global community to get behind it and, and make sure uh, we're sending that, they, that it's outcomes driven. You know, the whole purpose is to get aid across the pond into the hands of families that are in need. And Corinne, as of last, uh, over 300,000 pounds of targeted aid have already made it across. And we're we're still, you know, only six months in. So, Corinne, what a what a uh, initiative to be part of, right? Oh, it's such an important initiative. And I really applaud the team at Vector for, for keeping the momentum going. Um, this, this area of the Ukraine um, is going to need our support for years and years to come. Uh, the devastation is just, it, it's shocking to see in today's day and age. You're absolutely right. So, and the good news here, folks, hey, just come, we have a monthly planning session. The next one is Tuesday, October 18th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. There's no obligation. You can you can show up. You don't even have to say anything. You can gather market intel. And then if you're in position to give and support or you name it, ship, whatever, uh, of course, we'd welcome that, that contribution as we can help. This is really an, an outcomes action-driven initiative. So join us October 18th. We've dropped the link to that in the comments as well. Okay. So Corinne, let's say hello. We got, it looks like we got a big uh, lunchtime crowd here today. Nice. 
Uh, Josh Goody's tuned in from finally rainy Seattle. Maybe he's been having some dry Georgia weather like we've been seeing the last week or two, huh? Yeah, I like the dry weather myself. But <laughs> I don't mind it. My front yard, uh, you know, I'm trying to shy away from those big water bills. So, so we, the grass needs it. But Josh, great to have you back. We always enjoy your perspective here. Hey, Greg, back with us from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Greg pointed out, Corinne, um, a day or two ago, of some of the innovation work being done in Greg's hometown of Wichita, Kansas. He's like, hey, y'all might need to take a road trip. Greg, who knows? We'll, we'll see if that's in the cards. Uh, big thanks to Clay and Chantel and Amanda and Catherine, all the folks behind the scenes helping to make uh, today happen. David Glover, good morning, he says via LinkedIn from a beautiful southern Minnesota. Corinne, you ever been up to Minnesota? I have indeed. I have indeed. It is beautiful. It is gorgeous, especially if you time it right, where it's yep. not the coldest of the cold. Uh, but David, great to have you here. Uh, Catherine, great to have you here. Looking forward to a great live stream today, she says via LinkedIn. I agree. Hey, the newly credentialed Corinne, Jonathan, um, I'm going to get his last name wrong, Philippi, Philippi, I believe, from Louisiana. Corinne, he recently earned a CSCP. How cool is that? That is excellent. Congratulations, Jonathan. So, Jonathan, uh, you may still be dancing in the streets. That's that's a, a tough credential to get, so congrats. Of course, Chantel is with us, as we mentioned earlier. Great to see you, Chantel. Glormar is back with us. Good morning from Los Angeles. I'm on the road, but can't miss to join. Hey, love that, Glormar. I'm glad you're not missing. We enjoy your perspective. And we got a great show uh, uh, teed up here today. All right, a couple quick others. One, first time from sunny Sao Paulo, Brazil. Great to see you, Juan. Great and to have, have you with us. Have you been to Brazil, Corinne? You're going to surprise me with this answer. I have perhaps. not been to Brazil. I've been close, but I have not made it to Brazil. Uh, that makes two of us. But uh, Hesley Torres um, and his sister Selma were exchange uh, students and really extended family members back in the 80s. So Hesley and Selma, uh, who hailed from Brazil, were uh, special people. If you're watching, uh, we miss you. So Juan, great to see you. Looking forward to your perspective here today. Uh, row it is back via LinkedIn. Great to see you uh, and welcome in everybody. Okay, so y'all keep the perspective coming. We're going to dive into some big topics here today, especially focused on the wide world of industry analysts. And I promise you, you're going to learn some things that are in your blind spot here today. But Corinne, are we ready? Drum roll, please. We're we ready to bring in our, uh, our cleanup hitter today. Absolutely. Can't wait. All right. So uh, I want to welcome in Mr. Mike Griswold, Vice President Analyst with Gartner. <clears throat> hey, hey, Mike, how you doing? Hey, I'm great. We can't get enough baseball metaphors, so I don't, I don't <laughs> know if I'll be able to provide any. Uh, I'm not a huge <laughs> baseball fan, but uh, no, it's it's always great to be here with uh, with uh, with all of you and um, Corinne. We're not going to miss Greg at all. So happy to have you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Agreed. I'm with you. But, you know, speaking of baseball analogies, when I uh, alluded to you as being the cleanup hitter, uh, you should be the Austin Riley of global supply chain because that is, that, that is uh, depending on the game, that's oftentimes the cleanup hitter for the Atlanta Braves, the defending <laughs> World Series champion. But, hey, I digress. Yes. Um, okay. So, Corinne and Mike, I've got a really fun warm-up question, a little fun warm-up question we're going to start with, like we usually like to do. And by the way, folks, Mike joins us somehow on the first Wednesday of every month. It goes back uh, a couple years now. So these are some of our favorite episodes. Um, all right. So Mike, I'm going to start with you. So October 1st, 1982, right? Some, uh, what was that? 30 years ago, if my math is right? No, no, 40, 40 years 40 ago. 40 years ago. I was missing a decade. <laughs> Uh, so in October 1st, 1982, the first commercial compact disc player was released in Japan, went on sale in Japan. It was called the Sony CDP-101. have no idea what the acronym means, but stick with me here. So I've got to ask, uh, starting with you, Mike, what was the first CD that you can recall purchasing? Well, I'm glad you teed this up a little bit earlier because I had to really go back in the memory banks and and do some some searching around what was even around at that point. And I'm I'm pretty sure I've landed on probably uh, the Journey Frontiers album that had come out a little bit before that. That has faithfully and separate ways, and you know, obviously, there's a ton of Journey hits. Um, I'm guessing that was probably it. 
I love that, Mike. And speaking of Journey, of course, their big hit, uh, Don't Stop Believing, yes. which is Sopranos kind of reinvigorated. Did you know, Corinne and Mike, that that was uh, the lead singer's uh, dad's message to him when he was working his way uh, up the, the musical industry, um, you know, trying to become the Journey, right, that we all know and love. That was his, his encouragement to his son. I can't remember the lead singer's name right now, but Don't Steve Stop Perry. Believing. Yes, yeah, Steve Perry. Yeah. Keep keep fighting the good fight. Don't stop believing. So that was the the emphasis or the um, the genesis behind that big time tune. All right. So Corinne, Mike's was perhaps a journey album. How about you? Oh, I remember this vividly. So um, for those of you who may be too young and listening to us today, um, MTV was still new, and we would watch music videos. And um, this is when I believe right around 1982 is when Michael Jackson's Thriller album was released. And that music video was so much fun to watch. I do remember it being the first CD I purchased. Um, so CPD is Compact Portable Disc. Okay. 101. So um, <laughs> that's where that number came from or that name came from. But it makes so much sense. I was looking at like a serial number or something. So, hey, ask and you shall receive. Thank you uh, for that, Corinne. And yes, Yo! MTV Raps was a thing right back yeah. in the 80s. Uh, and that really, that's where I'm going to segue to my first CD. Uh, it wasn't a purchase because my mom, my dear Leah Luton, uh, my mother gave me this CD for Christmas when I got my first CD player. What in 81? It was like, I don't know, 89 or something. And Candyman, if y'all remember this yeah. rap artist named Candyman, uh, I'm not gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna riff any tracks. I'm not gonna do y'all bad like that. But uh, look that up, Candyman. There were some colorful like dots on the on the uh, the front of the uh, CD cover, and that's what started my home home library. So a lot of good stuff. So Journey, uh, MTV Raps, uh, Candyman, you name it. Uh, so marking October first, 1982, when the first commercial compact disc player went on sale. Okay. Before we dive in to our center topic, I want to say hello to just a couple of people. Uh, Gene Pledger from North Alabama is back with us. Good old GP. Good to see you. Uh, Josh is throwing some shade at Greg because his Tottenham Spurs lost 3-1 over the weekend. So he, Josh says that Greg picked a good time not to be here. Uh, Josh also says that Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, which is a yep. great album, was his yep. first CD. Yep. Um, Dr. Ron is back with us. Hope this finds you well. Mike, Corinna, Scott, awesomeness here today. Uh, and she says, love my MTV and the Thriller release. I think I was in the high school at the time. That was such a good album, wasn't it, Corinne? It was. Uh, and as Gene says, Thriller was huge back in the day. <laughs> Agreed. Thanks, um, Gene. <laughs> okay. so from Michael Jackson and that wonderful album to uh, the artists of the supply chain world, which uh, in some ways are our industry analysts, right? And that really, so... When we're thinking about what we're going to talk about with Mike here today and, and always trying, you know, as we do with any show, trying to keep it fresh and relevant and informative, Corinne had this great idea. Well, hey, you know, a lot of folks may not know what analysts do. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a great, a great outstanding opportunity for all of us to learn together from uh, Corinne and Mike that both are very familiar. So let's start by level setting. And I want both of y'all to start with Mike. What do, just to level set first, we're going to go into attributes in a minute, but what do industry analysts do, Mike? Yeah, it, it's um, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I've been doing this for 17 years and 17 years ago, I didn't even know that there was a thing called <laughs> an analyst or even an industry analyst when I when I first got started at, at the time with AMR. I mean, I, I think <clears throat> what, what our role is as an analyst is to be able to kind of bridge the gap based on, you know, our expertise and, and the time we've spent, you know, in a particular field or role is the is to is to provide that conduit for people that are are going through similar experiences and connecting them with answers. Whether that's a technology answer and a technology partner, whether it's, hey, here's what we've learned as you're going through this process. And here's kind of what works, what doesn't work, what to watch out for. Yeah, I like to think, I mean, the, you talked about that session that you're going to do at Sim around kind of connective tissue. I, I've, I've latched on to that because I think analysts in general are, are connective tissue between 
let's call it a, a pile of answers and people that have a pile of questions. <laughs> and it's our job to kind of connect those two piles. And yeah, I mean, I, I think at its essence, you know, one of the things I, I think I have a gift for is gross oversimplification. Yes. And that's what it is, right? <laughs> a, a pile of questions, a pile of answers, and we try to bridge the gap. I love that so much that I came up with an illustration, Corinne, of, of the pile of answers and the pile of <laughs> questions. So that's a technical drawing. Yeah. But um, so, Corinne, yeah. so what, what else would you add to that definition of what analysts do? Well, I, I think um, Mike actually said one thing that is really helpful, and that is that he's got the ability or an analysts in general have the ability to help simplify uh, some of the complexity. So that complexity comes from both sides of the equation, from the practitioner, from end users, as well as from solution providers. I think one thing that's important is it's not just software. It's mm. Um, services, so um, you know a, a variety of service companies, but they also do work around business process. Mm. So how do we structure an organization? How do we manage our teams? How do we look at you know development of personnel? So within the Gartner mix, they tap into all of these areas that help drive supply chain success. So they are kind of a connective tissue, right? Connecting answers to questions or really helping practitioners to prioritize um, where to go next as they're looking at imp improving their overall supply chain performance. Uh, which, Mike, go ahead. I knew you were Yeah, no, I, I think, Corinne, you, you hit on a key thing, which is the, the complexity piece. I mean, mm -hmm. I, as everyone knows, I, I've spent all my time in retail and one of the things that always fascinated me as I was going through the analyst, you know, journey is retail on the surface is a, it, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty simple thing. You buy stuff and you sell stuff. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Mm. Yet we've managed to make it pretty complex <laughs> over time. And I think that, that, you know, is exactly what we try to do as, as analysts is, is have that kind of objective perspective that says, you know, you really are overcomplicating this or you're not taking into account some of the complexities around some of the decisions that you're thinking about making. So it is about how do we help people kind of simplify some of the things that they're going through and some of their th the things they're thinking about. And Corinne is, is, is spot on. I mean, I don't know how many times I, I was on calls and, and people wanted to jump right to the technology solution. Yep. Hey, if I buy this technology, everything's going to be right with the world. And I saw that particularly when I was covering uh, SNOP and SNOE, sales and mm -hmm. operations planning and sales and operations execution, where people were saying, hey, what's the SNOP technology I need? And what I would tell them is, look, if I wave the magic you know, analyst wand and said, here's your technology tomorrow, if you don't have an SNOP process, you're it's a waste of money. So the people, process, and technology, again, pretty simple concepts, but that's as an analyst, you're always thinking around those three things, yes. right? In the advice that you give and the insights you're trying to, you know, connect people with their questions, it, it invariably comes through those three lenses. I love that. So many analogies here. So many analogies. Uh, I think of the Willy Wonka movie when all the kids are, are are going into the candy store. Because Mike, when you got a bunch of answers, you're like one of the most popular people on the planet. The answer man can. The answer man yeah. can. <laughs> uh, really quick, uh, Dr. Rhonda loves that analogy you're talking about. Both of y'all, that connective tissue. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark Holmes is going to be really happy with that. It, it's such a great visual and it's such a great need. Uh, both the examples you share, but also getting our technologies to talk to each other, right? Um, and Jeff, so when he shared this comment, he says, yes, 90125. I went to zip code. Uh, I was like, okay, what am I missing? But he's talking about the band, yes. And they released an album oh. called 90125, <laughs> okay. digital masterpiece, he says. Okay. I love that. Okay. So now that we've level set on what both of y'all, you know, how you define, uh, you know, what industry analysts do, I want to move to if we have the opportunity talk about vi visuals to build, to mold the perfect analyst. Right. Mm -hmm. um, 
So what are some key attributes that you want to make sure are in your cabinet so you, you could sprinkle in? And Mike, I want to start with you first. Yeah, I, I think there there is a couple. Uh, I think one is you have to have kind of an appetite to learn and mm -hmm. be able to, you know, be open to exploring kind of different avenues, maybe different approaches and alternatives that maybe you, you may not have been open to in the past. I'll give you an example. At our keynote, uh, at our both of our symposiums, you know, we, we talk about as supply chains for for I would say decades, you know, we we were just in time is the way to run your supply chain. The last two years, I think, have, have taught us, if we've had open minds, that just in time can be an appropriate strategy. It cannot be the only strategy, right? So being open to things like that, being able to be open to you know, what used to be conventional wisdom may not necessarily be complete conventional wisdom today. Mm. I, I think that's one. I think a second is being able to take concepts that you see maybe in other industries or in other types of organizations and be able to contextualize that for a broader audience. Mm. For me personally, SNOP and SNOE are perfect examples of that, right? Yep. Where we took what has been in consumer products and basically every other industry from retail has been in place for, you know, 30 years, wasn't present in retail, was an opportunity for us to, to bring that into retail. And I would suggest we're getting some traction. I don't know that it's as much as we would like, but mm. I think there are more retailers talking about SNOP and SNOE today than we had in the past. Uh, and I think the third element, which I, people who who, who watch this um, will know that this, this is true. Um, I think you, you need to be able to take advantage of social media, mm -hmm. which I don't do, I'm horrible at, and I'll be the first to admit it. But, but social media is a great way now to not only learn things, but a much, uh, a much um, in many ways, more efficient way to disseminate information, right? To, to take best practices and maybe blow it out through LinkedIn as an example. So to me, those are, are, are some of the, the, the DNA that I think, you know, makes for a good analyst. I love that. Evangelize, evangel yeah. uh, evangelizing platform. Whenever I say that, uh, Corinne, uh, a mutual contact, ours, a great friend of the show, uh, chief evangelist, uh, Will Hairway comes to mind. I used to, used to call Will Preacher Will across <laughs> yeah. that title. Love, love that. Um, so Corinne, uh, Mike's list was, if I was, if I can read my notes, openness, the importance of openness, the ability to transfer and contextualize and really take best practices from one sector or one industry to the other uh, in a meaningful way. And then, of course, to be able to use social media to share the good and the bad, probably both are very valuable um, but what would be what would be elements to your list of the perfect analyst, Corinne? Well, I think analysts come from uh, lots of different backgrounds. So I think some come from a practitioner background, like Mike himself, who came out of retail. Um, and I love Mike that you started with you need to be open minded because there are some analysts, some individuals who are not right. They they believe that they're the only one with the answer and that their way or their point of view. And I, I, I'm not kidding on this. Right. We 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 look for analysts um, that are open minded. We certainly want them to have a point of view um, that they bring to the table because they're defending a thesis. They're defending their perspective on the market. But that comes from you know, bringing together thought leaders in several areas. So practitioner roles, solution providers, services companies, but usually that expertise is around their subject matter that they're going to be representing in the marketplace. Um, and, and then bringing in some of these other ideas, like Mike, Mike was instrumental in bringing the conversation of sales and operations planning and sales and operations execution to the forefront for retailers mm. because they just, it wasn't on their radar screen and they didn't see the value proposition around it. 
and they certainly have made headway. Still, still lots and lots of opportunity mm. to go. But when I think of Mike, I think of his influence. So these industry analysts have become influencers. So thus the social media elements that, that Mike mentioned uh, come into play. But open-minded expertise in, in the domain that you're representing, I think is, is key. And the ability, since they're sitting in the middle, the ability to speak with practitioners about tough topics, prioritization, right right? Where their culture may come into play. Do they have a culture of doing these types of transformation initiatives? Um, but then also working with solution providers. And, you know, you talk about some bright people um, that are doing interesting things, but may be taking a completely different approach to how to solve the problem. The, uh, the analyst has to be open to asking questions, right? And, and, and engaging on how that problem gets solved. So um, a lot of times these industry analysts who have fabulous credentials have to check their ego enough that they can ask questions because it gives them that authority to engage at just a whole nother level. And I would think that that's, you know, that's gotta be tough to find, Mike. Well said. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, um, very well said. I mean, I, I think if if people have spent, I, I and hopefully I I'm not in this camp. I try not to be. But if you spend any time with analysts, we we can certainly be high maintenance. Um, <laughs> if, if you bring ten analysts together, you're going to get ten opinions. Um, I I think you know, Corinne, you you hit on a very important um, aspect to the role, which is finding that balance between. You know, confidence in your opinion, confidence in in you know what your experiences have have led where they've led you, but not being arrogant, yeah. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you, you grow up as or as an analyst to kind of say, you know, you need to own this topic, you need to be you know the subject matter expert on this, and if you're not careful as an analyst, that that does can lead you down the road that that Corinne you talked about about not being which is not open minded. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah it it is I mean we've we've um we, even within Gartner right we we've changed some of our vocabulary to be you know experts and frankly that makes me uncomfortable right I I I don't refer to myself as an expert at all um even on things that I think I know a fair amount about but um it is finding that balance between, yeah, you know, I, I do this for a living, so I, I know what I'm talking about, but not kind of just ramming your thoughts down people's throats that maybe, you know, aren't ready to hear it. So, oh, man. I love so much of what both y'all shared. We could create like a six hour conversation around this. But, you know, I, for one, when y'all are both talking about, you know, the difference between confidence and arrogance, I don't think that's a thin line. I think that is a, uh, a there's a lot of distance between those two areas. And some of the smartest people I know, uh, Ray Atia is on a live stream right now. I worked for Ray back in the day and he is a genius, much like y'all too. He is a genius. However, he is so humble enough to welcome everybody's opinion in the room. And that is that's where we can really move things forward, move it faster and, and celebrate new ideas. Mike? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great comment. I mean, I think in general, right, and, and hopefully people will take this the right way. Typically, the analyst is going to be, you know, if we go back to the two piles, right, the pile of questions and the pile of answers, <laughs> right. right? Typically, the analyst is going to be the smartest person in the room. The, the art to this is not coming across as if you're the smartest person in the room and not telling people you're the smartest person in the room. <laughs> that That is... That's the art, I think, and and to I mean I, I Corinne, as you were going through that your discussion on analysts, there I was having visuals of of analysts that I know that fit into both of those categories. So, yeah, it's two um, of us. Yeah, yeah, that makes two of us, Mike Corinne. So so the analysts are in um, a, an interesting, a very interesting position, right? So uh, practitioners engage with them because they don't make these buying decisions or investment decisions every single day, right? They want to tap an expert right. to help them prioritize and um, set expectations and sometimes even benchmark performance. 
Uh, so it's very, very valuable from that perspective. Now, at the same time, the solution providers or service providers are going to engage with an industry analyst in part because they want to validate their own capabilities and their own unique value proposition, but they also want to know what the priorities are for the end users, right? So the analysts are really aggregating all of that expertise because of all of their um, personal expertise, but that exposure that they have to practitioner companies and helping to kind of guide, if you will, some of that innovation investment that happens with service providers. So as long as you know technology providers, service providers are open, right? They have to be open to hearing as well as sharing what their unique value proposition is. So it can be a very, very um, uh, important relationship for um, for solution providers as well as for those practitioners. Well said. Uh, I want to share a couple of quick comments here, uh, and then we're going to chat about a couple of events. I might even take a question or two here as I survey the comments. But uh, Renee says, being adaptive and open to change goes a long way with the desire to lead. It seems new tools launch daily for us analytic folks. And Renee has a lot of truth in that statement there. We, we're uh, it's like a tools bonanza these days, right? Uh, tools. The tools have the tools and have more tools for the tools. Uh, Josh says uh, on, on our show not too long ago, quote, one of our guests said, quote, it's not a supply chain anymore. It's a supply web. Going back yeah. to the connected tissue uh, conversations we were having. And Gene says customer has to buy in as well for success also. Mm -hmm. So arrogance uh, would impede that. Right. Good point there, uh, Gene, as always. Um, we've got a little time here. We've got, we've got a couple of questions uh, that I want to pose to y'all, and hopefully you'll be okay with this. Uh, a couple acronyms, the one that came up earlier in the show and and one that comes from uh, uh, supply chain body knowledge out there. Um, but let's get your final comment on analysts. Let's say, um, you know, whether, whether organizations are considering working with one or maybe some of our listeners would like to become an analyst. You know, Corinne, we were talking pre-show. Gartner, Mike, y'all got an army of very talented analysts there at Gartner, right? Um, what's one last thought for anyone that may be considering those things? What's one last thing that they should know or consider? Mike? So I'm hoping that in, in just the short time we had today, that people are aware of the role because you know, it once once I got in it, it was it, it's it's a great it is a great role from the standpoint of dealing with lots of different types of of questions being able to, to help lots of different people. I mean, our, our Gardner analysts will have between 350 and 500 interactions with clients in the course of a year. And, and obviously not all of them are different, but they're different enough, right? And, and, the, and the impact that you can have in talking to someone in an hour, you, you just don't get that you know, in, in any other role. The, 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 it's different day to day. And, and the ability for, for most of, 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 regardless of whether it's Gardner or anyone else, the ability to do research, right? To be able mm -hmm. to go into new areas, do research, write about it, talk about it, present on it. Um, you know, I think for anyone that's got, you know, five plus years of experience in industry, it's definitely worth thinking about, you know, as, as, a, as a job. You know, when I got into it at AMR, I was convinced that it would be my next to last job really? because of the people you meet, the connections you make as an analyst, the level of organizations that you get to talk to. So as an analyst, you're talking to, you know, VPs, you know, now our analysts are talking to chief supply chain officers. Those connections you make, you know, can set you up for your next job. But as I got into the job and as, you know, we moved to Idaho and I wasn't going to move, um, it became clear that this could be my last job. And it, you know, unless either Powerball or, you know, <laughs> something happens that I don't see on the horizon with Gartner, this will be my last job. And it, it's it, it's just the experiences um, you know, are really hard to describe, but they're really, really good. Well, Mike, uh, regardless of what the crystal ball holds, as Corinne eloquently said earlier, 
you have made a big impact. And I'll tell you, someone with all of your knowledge to be as humble as you are and, and willing to engage. And just like you're talking to, you know, um, you name anybody uh, that is, I think that's, that's what's moving industry forward, right? Because those folks that may not have all the experience, but have awesome ideas. They just have, don't have years and years of experience. They're willing to to bring those to bear and, and talk about them versus being, you know, fearful that uh, arrogance is going to squash them. So Mike, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Corinne, your last comment about uh, analysts. So I, they, they play a very important role. Um, and they deliver value on both sides of, of really their client base. Um, but uh, I think my, my advice to solution providers is to think of it as an ongoing conversation. Don't approach every interaction as a brain dump where you're going to tell them everything they need to know about your company or your unique value proposition. Um, think of it as a long-term strategic relationship. Uh, because that's where the real value proposition will come. Um, and they want exposure to your executive team as well. So this isn't a media relations um, relationship. This right. is a strategy relationship. And that strategy incorporates not just the technology you bring to the table, but your partner ecosystem, your customer success. Um, they want to be able to, um, to understand that in the context of where they see the industry going. Right. Um, so that's, you know, when they're asking questions and delving deeper, it's not to find the, the four things that are wrong with your business. It's to help them put in some categories or expand how they're thinking about uh, the industry and the opportunity ahead as well. Love that. A um, couple of quick comments here. Yako's with us uh, from Brazil. Mm. And he's good with the advice you are giving. I love that succinctness. Uh, blessed are folks that can be succinct. So I love that, uh, Yako. Great to have you here. T squared, who holds down the Fort Force on YouTube. Now get this. Now, admittedly, I had to look up what amorphous means. But he says, be adaptive, but not amorphous. So amorphous for folks that may have, well, I'm not going to throw shade at where, where I went to school, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it is with, <laughs> without a clearly defined shape or form. Amorphous. That is a wonderful T-shirtism there, T squared. Uh, T squared. Great to have you. Um, and so then I want to circle back. Now that we've kind of had a great conversation on analysts, I really appreciate both of y'all's perspective. Been there, done that perspective on um, the the profession, how to engage them, how to lean in, uh, what makes a good one. I mean, it's really a, a great holistic conversation. So on a different note, we mentioned on the front end, Jonathan uh, has added a new credential. And uh, he brings up this acronym, uh, collaborative, collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment. C C P F R. Thank you. Yes. A little too much coffee this morning, I believe. But what are your thoughts uh, here? I'm gonna pose this maybe to uh, Corinne. Let's start with you, maybe. What are your thoughts on C P F R when it comes to integrating technology? Any thoughts there? Oh. Please, we could do a whole session, Mike, couldn't we, on CPFR? Um, so it it is um, a framework that was developed more than 20 years ago at this point in time with the goal in the consumer goods and, and retail market space to accelerate visibility and supply chain performance. Um, I believe that we are seeing pockets of resurgence around CPFR, collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment. So think about that as what you do with your trading partner, whether mm -hmm. you're the supplier or you're the customer in that network. And how do we replace risky inventory with valuable information? Um, so it's, um, it's worthwhile to dig into and look at how you can apply to your business. And by the way, technology is available to help with that and has been for decades now, but I think businesses are now maybe in a better position to really deploy the process of collaborative planning along with the technology of collaborative planning. I love that. Uh, and, and, and so that's not, you're not hunting a technology, you're identifying the, the business problem and finding the appropriate technology that can, that can fit that business problem. It's part of what I heard you, you say there, Corinne. Um, Mike, Pose the same question to you from our friend, Jonathan, your thoughts on CPFR with integrating technology. 
Yeah, th this is this is exactly how an inquiry would come across to an analyst, right? Th this this would be the question. I agree with Corinne completely on on the point around the technology. It's been a the, tech, the CPFR has not stalled or did not stall because of lack of technology. It stalled on the on the process and and, and that side. I think you know if a client were to lob that question into me, I would tackle it from the standpoint of let's not worry about what we call it. Let's worry about what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, so with CPFR, are we trying to solve the, the, the collaborative forecasting piece? Are we trying to solve getting on the same page on the demand signal? With CPFR, are we trying to solve the inventory? You know, Corinne talked about risky inventory. Are we trying to solve the right inventory in the right location at the right time? So those are the, th I mean, to me, what you don't want to have is, is CPFR running around an organization trying to find a problem. What you want is a problem that CPFR aligns with. And then, you know, again, Corinne made an excellent point around once you've identified those technologies there to help us. But, you know, you, you just you can't take you can't have the technology tail wagging the dog or, or you, you just you won't get anything done. So what problem are we trying to solve and then go from there? Love that. Uh, I'm, my brain's working overdrive to find the right baseball analogy there. I'll have to circle back. It hasn't arrived at one yet. Um, hey, really quick, Jason T. Hopkins. Great to have you back. Uh, Jason says, hey, Mike and Scott, uh, been a minute. Glad to see you're still at it for the supply chain community. We are. Uh, me and Mike and Corinne, the whole supply chain now team. And Jason, hope this finds you. I think you're in D.C. You may still be in D.C. And He's either a Bama fan or an Auburn fan. It's really bad, Corinne, I, I know, to get those intertangled. But Jason, let us know where your allegiances <laughs> are. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's do this. It is football season two, right? Um, let's do this. Uh, I want to talk about the next big project, Mike, that you're working in Garden. I know we only got you for you know a few more minutes here. What's the next big thing? Uh, well, it's for me. It's it's top twenty five. So the supply chain top 25 process will be kicking off uh, for 2023. We'll be kicking off uh, in November uh, with you know companies having the option to to talk to us about their supply chains. You know all the stuff we do behind the scenes. You know that that's the next um, big thing for me. Um, my team is working on you know our we're we're already thinking about. Sim supply chain symposium for next year. So we're in the process in the next couple of weeks of, of pulling our submissions together. Uh, first week in May in Orlando, first week in June in Barcelona, which is a, a new, well, not so much new. We, we, we were there pre-COVID, then we were in London, and Barcelona is going to be our Europe home, uh, I think, uh, for the for the foreseeable future. So Top 25, as well as getting ready for SIM for next year. Outstanding. Uh, and speaking of lists at Gartner, um, we are looking forward to, we've been interviewing a bunch of the, the schools on the list of top supply chain mm, yes. uh, institutions and universities. So that's been a, a blast, including the top ranked Arkansas, um, uh, uh, University of Arkansas. That's been a lot of fun. So stay tuned. Uh, so you might keep doing the great work. We, hey, we love lists around here. I'll tell you. Yes. Uh, Corinne. He mentioned symposiums. So yes. here's a two part, two part. I uh, uh, want to get you involved here. Um, first off, you touched on earlier what you admired about Mike's approach. So if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. And then I know you've been keeping tabs on just how successful the symposiums have been. Corinne, please uh, tell more. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, just just kind of a word about Mike. I've known Mike and had the opportunity to work with him. Mike, for probably more than 15 years now, probably early in your days when you were with um, with AMR. Um, and what I love working with Mike about is one, he is an expert, but he is humble and he is a lifelong learner. I mean, he can ask questions that on the surface seem simple, but then he's digging back and pulling back the layers and really getting to the crux of, you know, of, of what should be addressed and maybe when it should be addressed. So um, it's it's a real um, privilege to have the opportunity to engage with Mike on a variety of topics. So, Mike, thanks so much for that. Thanks for staying curious and thanks for sharing so generously with us here on Supply Chain Now, but also through the years 
um, some of that hard earned expertise that you always bring to the table. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And with regard to the symposium that Mike just mentioned, um, so this is billed as, you know, the largest and most important gathering of chief supply chain officers and supply chain executives. And it's actually two different um, conferences, but they, they, they cover the bulk of the same um, research and trends from Gartner. And then there are some sessions that are unique, but Gartner does that so that they can actually share that information on both continents, both on North America and in Europe. Um, so it's it's geographically more appealing for folks that are traveling. Um, but Mike, it's my understanding that both the North American event and the European event that just happened last week, um, both of those were oversubscribed. Like attendance wow. at the events exceeded Gartner's expectations. Is that correct? Um, it is. the The North American event was our largest supply chain event that we've ever had. Uh, and then the same was true for London. And in fact, it 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 was it sold out. So um, we we had a uh, and it was sold out. I think primarily because of the venue, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the space that it yeah. could hold. But it, it is, you know, it, it is the place to go. I mean, I think the other thing I'll share is um, for twenty. So in twenty twenty three, we'll have the two sims that we've been talking about, but we're also going to launch um, two summits to uh to planning summits that are focused on people that live in the planning space there the one will be uh they'll be in october and november i may have them transposed i think it's uh october in phoenix in november in london so you know we we target in the symposium chief supply chain officers and their direct reports these summits are really geared towards those direct reports uh, and we're starting in planning. We we did a very successful planning summit 2019 in Denver, yeah. which was our very first one. It was very, very well received. And then obviously we all know what happened after 2019, but we're, we're going to launch them uh, again in 2023. And we're really excited about, about how they're going to do. Outstanding. Lots of opportunities uh, to plug in, exchange, uh, market intel, best practices, uh, new technologies, new practices, I'll call it, and uh, connect with friends across global supply chain and more. Um, right before you leave, Mike, uh, a couple of comments here. So let's celebrate. First off, uh, Jason is moving back from D.C. to Alabama. He's a new father. So oh, congratulations, congratulations to, to Jason from the whole team here. That is outstanding. And he's also making fun. He's like, oh, my gosh, it's Alabama. <laughs> and he talks about <laughs> Alabama football looks great this year with all that touchdown supply chain, very effective uh, touchdown supply chains here in Bama. Now, folks, y'all should know Corinne is an <laughs> Auburn alum and big fan. Um, yeah. So Auburn, hey, Auburn's on the way back for sure. Yeah, um, they're on the way somewhere. I'm not sure <laughs> quite where we're headed this season. But so we, so we have a we have a correct uh, connection, Corinne, because the Auburn coach uh, was the Boise State coach. Yeah, uh, so Brian Harson. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully, hopefully he's, uh, I, I know there's not often a lot of patience in Auburn, so hopefully he can, he can get things where you want them to be. Yeah. Well, when you're, when you're down the road from Alabama and Alabama has had decades yes. of success, the, um, yeah, the, the timeline is very compressed. Let's put it yes. that way. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Jonathan, who posed that question earlier, uh, says excellent advice, but he throws in there. I go tiger. So he's a big LSU. So, <laughs> Hey, we open a can of football and everyone's that ready. Yes. I thought we were going to be friends. The last thing I need <laughs> is for you and Gene to start ganging up on me. Oh man. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Mike, always a pleasure. I uh, really enjoyed you and Corinne both here today. I know we got to let you go to the mic. How can folks connect with you and the whole Gartner team? Uh, LinkedIn and email. Uh, in, in fact, email, is probably more, res I'm probably more responsive to email than the LinkedIn stuff. So Mike.Griswold at Gardner.com. I'm happy to chat with folks around anything. Wonderful. It's just that easy. Well, big thanks, Mike Griswold with Gartner. We'll see you uh, next month in about a, about a month good. or so. All right. Sounds you, great. Mike. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Hey, even the swoosh was able to catch up with Mike this time. How about that? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Um, Oh, all right. And by the way, Gene says that he wouldn't do that to you, Corinne. 
uh, going back and forth talking football. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Gene. Uh, there's a daughter that Jason had, and her name is Lyric. That is awesome, Jason. Congrats to the whole team here. Uh, I love that name as well. Um, okay, so Corinne, uh, we covered a lot of ground here today, and I wish we had a couple more hours. Uh, you know, we're, we're nerding out on all things supply chain, then some, which is a good thing to do yep. these days. Um, what is, if you had to, um, we'll talk tech talk in just a second, but if there's one thing, if folks forgot everything else we shared over the last 49 minutes, what's one thing they should keep on the radar front and center? One thing from our conversation today? Yeah, please. Um, it is just how can you tap into an industry analyst to either help you gain focus around your priorities um, or engage with the right partners? And, um, and Mike didn't say this, but they're not going to give you one partner. They'll give you kind of a short list of folks that you may want to consider working with that would be a good fit for you, your industry, the level of maturity that your business is in today. So they really try to uh, kind of play that matchmaker, if you will, and give you some options. So you're spending your time investing your resources wisely as you uh, pursue the next innovation opportunity. Yeah, well said there. I really appreciate that. I mean, there's some parallels between working with analysts and finding the right technology. Make make sure it's a fit, right? Yep. Uh, do the, uh, I wouldn't call it speed dating, but you know, do that due diligence on the front end and uh, whether, you know, um, not being committed to a single analyst perhaps, or not being certainly not being committed to a single technology, make sure there's a business case for regardless and plenty of options. Mm -hmm. um, Corinne, really have enjoyed our chat here today. What a great idea for a show. Um, I'm not sure. So, you know, this afternoon we're recording episode 1000 for Supply wow. Chain Now. And I don't think in any of those shows we have touched on the uh, important critical role of what analysts do. So uh, I I've really enjoyed the last hour. Um, tell us, though, shifting gears as we start to wind things down. Um, I think I've got a graphic here today. Today we published an episode of, uh, well, wrong button. Uh, we, we published an episode of Tech Talk, looking for a supply chain crystal ball. What you missed at the Gartner Supply Chain Symposium 2022 with, I think, some additional commentary from you. So tell us about this and what's to come. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Scott, congratulations on 1,000 episodes to you and the entire team at Supply Chain Now. What a milestone. Mm. Um, that's that's exciting. I, I didn't realize that uh, 1,000 was... Isn't it crazy? Yeah, it yeah. snuck up on us a little bit. I, I remember when we were talking about episode 300 yep. uh, and I think Amanda and I got together for episode 600 and it almost really surprised us. But uh, it's been a team effort, you know, the family around here and um, it's something we all celebrate together for sure. Yeah, but, I mean, hey. that's that's a lot of thought leadership right there. Mm, 1,000 mm. episodes. That, that's impressive. Um, regarding this episode for Tech Talk, first of all, I want to invite all of our Supply Chain Now community to... Um, take a listen to Tech Talk if you haven't tapped into it yet and to subscribe. Uh, but this particular episode, I actually started it off with a perspective on the important role of industry analysts and um, really did that with the intent of introducing why events like the, the Gartner Supply Chain Symposium is, um, is so important for sharing ideas and engaging around the latest and greatest um, research and trends in the marketplace so that we can, you know, transform our supply chain operations and deal with the volatility that we all continue to experience in the marketplace. So, um, you know, I, I kind of called that looking for a supply chain crystal ball. So a few ideas for you in there. Um, you know, uh, there, there's no silver bullet. For anybody who's listening, um, but there are lots of good, uh, lots of good insights. I think that you'll be able to take away from the episode. Uh, I completely agree. And you know, nothing's easy. And if it's easy, you better kick the tires on it because it's probably not worth it. Uh, I think everyone's crystal balls are are broken. Um, um, but you know, with all of that, I, you know, I was talking this morning. I, I was telling you and the team about a couple of interviews we had earlier today. And, you know, still a lot of the best some of the best good news out there is all these challenges we've been through in the last two or three years, whether it's blockchain or whether it's life in general, 
you know, we have found, so we've had some very big, powerful Eureka lessons that is driving uh, different approaches, different solutions, mm -hmm. ways to do business. And, you know, we all talk about that word at cliche resilience, but if anything powers true resilience, it's how we apply these uh, experiences, uh, both the, the days when you're on top of the mountain and the days when you're down in the valleys and how we've got overcome them, how we're applying that. And, and really as an industry, uh, working on becoming truly more anti-fragile and more resilient. So, um, Corinne, I appreciate what you do there. I appreciate the, um, the ideas and inspiration, the information you put out on, on tech talk. So folks, you can find that wherever you get your, your podcast, make sure you subscribe. So you don't miss an episode. Corinne, we publish an episode every other Wednesday, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So mark your calendar, tie, tie a string around your finger. That old practice still may work in, <laughs> in some ways. Hey, thanks for all the uh, the congrats uh, on the comments. Uh, Dr. Rhonda says, it's okay to diversify those relationships and work with partners based upon the needs at hand. Great information, yep. Corinne. I agree. And better yet, we love being making things convenient around here. We have dropped the link to today's Tech Talk episode right there. And this is the Easy Play link. You click that and uh, you can listen to the full episode. It's very easy. I love that. Um, all right, so Corinne. How can folks connect with you and all the cool things you're up to? Yeah, I would love it if you would connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, that is a great way uh, and will keep you out of my, my inbox um, <laughs> deluge that uh, seems to fill up every day. Um, but I'd also welcome your comments on any of the sessions as well, any of the episodes. Um, it would be great just to hear your take on the topics um, because you're out there doing it every day as well. So I, I think we all learn from each other. Agree. Oh, definitely. That's, that's probably the best part of the whole journey. Mm -hmm. As Gene Pledger says, hey, thank you, Scott and Corinne. Makes my day to visit with friends. And hey, I'm with you, uh, Gene, and the exchange of perspectives and intel is definitely the best part of the journey. Okay. Well, big thanks to Corinne Bursa. Really enjoy these conversations with you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. You bet. Uh, big thanks to everyone who showed up. Uh, gosh, all the comments we could get to, a lot of them we couldn't get to. I uh, really appreciate that uh, active listenership. Of course, Mike Griswold, home run guest each and every time. I love that. He'll be back with us the first Wednesday of November. Big thanks to our team. It it uh, it, it sounds cliche as, as all get out, but it truly, truly takes a village to do anything of consequence uh, here in the omni world that we live in. So with all that said, hey, Scott Luton challenging all of our listeners it's all about deeds, not words, right? Taking action, enough with, enough with lip service. Challenging all to do good, to give forward, and to be the change that's needed. And with that said, we'll see you next time right back here on Sapache Now. Thanks, everybody.